Okay, so... Not necessarily related to phylogeny. I just didn't really know where else to put this, but uh, thinking about evolution and like, you know, how, how can you get like broad species changes? Um, or even like it could be something as small as like here are the examples like butterfly color. Like how did you get the different colors of butterflies? And there's two like schools of thought. One would say, hey, the butterflies change color gradually. And we call that gradualism. So, you know, if I were to gradually turn off the lights, I am slowly making it darker. So the idea of gradualism here is the, fly, the, the butterflies are slowly changing color. Now, the other side of the spectrum uh, would be something called punctuated equilibrium. So if I were to punctuate your lung, if you punctured your lung, you got a, like a, a hole in your lung. Maybe you got shanked in your lung, right? That would be something that's very drastic. So punctuated equilibrium would say, uh, oh, and when they say equilibrium, they're saying like we broke genetic equilibrium. So things are evolving. So how we broke genetic equilibrium and punctuate equilibrium is the butterfly changed color very quickly. Like there was some sort of event. So this is kind of key to understand. There's some sort of event like a, an asteroid or something or like the industrial revolution actually, like uh, the changing of like uh, the color of trees, like some sort of event would then lead to a change in the environment that would select for um, these different uh, colors of, uh, of the butterflies. So that could be something like that could happen. So very um, rapid evolution in short periods of time. Okay, now then getting into uh, phylogeny. Now, um, Phylogeny and cladistics, those, those terms are essentially synonyms. Basically, what we do in phylogeny is we're trying to um, get, a, get an idea of like a, a timeline of evolutionary history. How, how would we sort of um, organize the, uh, uh, the history of how species have evolved? So um, the different pieces of evidence that they use for that, back in the day when they didn't really have, you know, um, DNA and fancy lab equipment, they really had to rely a lot on like the fossil record, like seeing where will we find this fossil like in earth, like um, like in what layer of the earth do we find uh, the fossil? Or like comparing like the structures of different organisms being like, hey, if, if um, you know, like a, lot, like a classic thing would be like, if these things have, have wings, all the things that have wings, they must be related to each other evolutionarily. Or, you know, other things like that. Now, the last two bullet points, this is what like evolutionary biologists really rely on now. And that's the biochemical uh, similarities and looking at um, what we call molecular clocks. So molecular clocks are really interesting because uh, it reminds me a little bit of the idea of radioactive decay. If we know like the rate that a radioactive atom breaks apart, like breaks down, um, we can use that to like essentially date a fossil. Well, we can do a similar thing in evolution where if we know the rate that a really key protein that's common in like all species mutates or changes, and you see, say you see like there is 30 changes to a certain protein in one organism, but only five changes in a certain protein in another organism, you would know like the, how, how far apart these two organisms are in terms of like evolutionary history is the idea of the molecular clock. Anyways, um, how you would interpret a phylogenetic tree, the ancestor, the oldest pop, uh, ancestor will always be towards the bottom. And then each time you hit like a node right here, like one of these branch points, each branch point represents a speciation event. Some sort of event, usually this is a new trait, something new happens that will then lead to a different descendant evolving. Okay. Um, how we uh, so we'll look at things called shared traits and derived traits. Let me let me just go to the next slide and like look at an actual one uh, to explain it. Uh, so you need to be able to know how to read one of these, but also how you would make one. How you make one, you would start with a character table. So in this character table, we're looking at um, six different organisms up here, and we're looking at six different characters. If you have a one, that represents that you have the character. If it's a zero, you don't have the character. So you'll notice here that only the leopard has hair. 
Conversely, the lancelet is the only thing that does not have a vertebral column. So what we do is the lower down something is, so the vertebral column, this little branch point right there, it, it's going to be at the very bottom because more of the organisms, all five of these organisms have a vertebral column. And then the out group, this is the thing that doesn't share any of the common features. So that's why the lancelet is the out group, because the lancelet is the only thing that wasn't uh, invited to the vertebral column party. So it is a thing that's kicked out. Now, going on, jaws, what this would be saying is that only the, the tuna, salamander, turtle, and leopard, they are the only ones that evolved jaws. The lamprey and the lancelet, they don't have jaws. Same thing with the four walking legs. So kinds of questions they could ask you. Um, what features does the tuna not have? Okay. Yeah, good. So the, the tuna, because the tuna is below these three traits, the tuna does not have the walking legs, the amniotic egg, or the hair. Okay, that can be a little tricky, I think, to answer when, it, when they phrase it like that. So make sure you understand that. How to like, if they phrase it, what do they have or not have for different organisms? Okay, let me show you uh, a couple other examples. Oh, this is trying to show that like, you can make different phylogenetic trees depending on what traits you focus on. So meaning here, if I focus on, um, oh, the shape of the shells, so here, the barnacle and the limpet, they're gonna be um, they're gonna be grouped together. So conical shell, this would be the trait that caused the branch or um, yeah, this would be the trait that caused the branch point here. So then the crab would be the out group of the barnacle and the limpet. But let's say I'm now looking at it from the frame of like, well, what about segmentation? Well, now segmentation having like joints and stuff. The crab and the barnacle, they both have segmentation. The limpet now would be the outgroup um, and no longer the crab. Okay, So these trees can change depending on what you tend to focus on. Um, they also can change like, uh, like this one is focusing more on like, if you focus more on like specifically genetic traits, that can change how like the phylogenetic trees have been made. Meaning like phylogenetic trees that were made in like the 1900s, early 1900s, before DNA evidence had to be changed once we have better understanding of the DNA to see how related two organisms are. Anyways, the biggest thing you need to understand for the AP exam, again, is how to make and how to interpret one. So here's just another example. This would be the primate cladogram. So, you know, they could ask you, um, what traits do uh, the spider monkey have? So it have, yeah, it would have all of these things on there. Which traits does it not have? It would have everything above that. It does not have the downward pointing nose, loss of tail, or uh, the, the loss of opposable thumb. Okay. Uh, again, next class I'll give you some practice problems on this, but uh, that's really it. Nothing too crazy.